Good morning, everybody. It is Pastor Matt Stokes from Coastal Christian coming to you with a morning meditation. And uh, what a beautiful day. My room is a mess. You know that whole thing about make your bed and everything? All right, just didn't happen today. What was cool is Laura got up like before the dawn and decided to like train with me in the morning, which is pretty great. Um, and what happened is my car's in the shop. So the fob I have to get into the gym is on that keychain. So we drove all the way to the gym and couldn't get in because we're the only ones there like that early in the morning. And uh, so it was like, I want to say it was a wasted trip, but it wasn't because we got to spend time together and ended up just talking. And then I'm like, we're definitely working out. So when we got home, she jumped on the elliptical and I grabbed some dumbbells and like, we just still had to like do, crush it. You know what I mean? Like, don't give up. Don't just say, oh, well, couldn't get in. So we're just going to skip it. It was like, we've got to do this. Right. So, um, feels good. So I've already had my coffee and, um, and, uh, spend some time in some, uh, getting my heart rate up. So I'm ready to get into, get into Proverbs chapter 29. So let's turn there together. And, uh, so glad some of you were able to come on this morning. And, uh, I'm telling Jordan Peterson, what are you going to tell Jordan Peterson? Uh, I actually listened to him this morning too along with uh, Jocko Willinks. I listen to certain guys every day, like for a few minutes in the morning, just because, um, man, there's a lot there. I wish I could tell you what I was listening to from Jordan Peterson. I guess he was talking about um, uh, certain frustrations that get in the way of your goal, and then you reach that defining moment as to what you're going to do. Are you gonna break through the wall of the frustration to accomplish the goal, or are you gonna let the frustration come um, in like a wrecking ball, if you will, and kind of just, um, just destroy your motivation to reach the goal. And that's directly related to how strongly you feel about the goal, right? Because if you really feel strongly about the goal, then you're not going to let, uh, even a wrecking ball. Like if I'm really feeling strongly about having a peanut butter sandwich, if, if a wrecking ball comes through the kitchen, I'm going to eat that peanut butter sandwich sitting in a pile of rubble because that's how strongly I feel about the goal that I had to reach, which was I'm hungry and I want to eat. I know that's a pretty bad, I don't know, work with that analogy, but that's kind of what I took from today. Um, Proverbs 29 and, uh, Glad you guys are joining. I'll pray and then we'll hit this for a few minutes and I hope that it will be helpful to you. Um, let me find it. My pages are sticking a little together, maybe because it's a little humid out here in the yard. Okay, let's give this a shot. Lord, we just come to you and we want to continue to let the day open up with your word, laying the foundation for where it is we're going to go mentally, where we're going to go in our hearts, where our souls find themselves. And that has so much to do with the decisions that we make. And your word, particularly Proverbs, has so much to do with decision making as well. So we pray that we would go in today into today with an extra measure of wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of your word in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Proverbs chapter 29 is where we're going to be. Jesse wanted to earlier this month do a proverb a day and so many things are coming up. I'm not sure how long we're going to be able to keep the morning meditation because the day is starting sooner than ever. And, um, uh, yeah, even this one's going to be a little quicker, but, um, it's such a blessing to see you guys coming on. So I just feel like, man, if it's that helpful to you, we really want to keep it up. Um, so it's, you know, we're, we're, we're well into our second year of Monday through Friday with the exception of some surgical stuff with me or whatever. We've been doing this. We're well into our second year now. So, um, as long as the schedule allows, we're going to keep trying to make it happen. So, um, thanks for being a part of it. Proverbs chapter 29 says this. Let me set this up here. All right. He that bringeth, he that, wait, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Okay? So a person that's often reproved, hardens his neck, 
shall suddenly be destroyed and not without remedy. Now, this expression, just because I happen to know that the chapter to some degree. When it says they hardened their neck, it has the imagery there in the Hebrew of an oxen who does not want to have the yoke put upon his neck, right? So that he can actually be used to plow the soil. And so what does he do? He hardens his neck so that the, so that the, the harness can't be put on his neck. He hardens himself against the harness. And it says the one that hardens their neck when they're being corrected shall suddenly, suddenly be destroyed. And that word destroyed has to do with a potter's vessel that's been smashed, if you will, like by a rod, an iron rod. And it's, it says, and that without rep remedy. So what happens to that potter's vessel? It's irreparable. It's completely damaged. And what he's saying is, here's the point. When correction comes into your life, if you continually shrug off the correction, what's going to happen is it's going to bring a certain amount of destruction to your life to the point that it's actually irreparable, right? It can't be fixed. At a certain point, you know, you're so hardened that you just have no more hearing left in your own soul to be able to receive instruction. And you might know some people like that that just can't receive correction. They can't receive instruction. And if you want to, whether it's whether it's putting together, you know, a picket fence and you just want to show them a better way to, to draw the lines and make the cuts, some people just don't want to be told where they're making a mistake. Now, the scripture says that a wise man loves reproof. It says in Proverbs chapter 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Give instruction to um, a wise man and he will increase in learning. So are you willing to receive a wise man loves correction? Are you willing to receive it? If somebody has a better way, bring it on. Show it to me. Help me understand because in the end, I'm going to be a better person because I humbled myself to listen to your instruction, to listen to your correction. What would hinder you from doing that? Well, pride because I already think I have the best way or insecurity. I don't want you to reveal that I don't have the best way and I'm afraid of how people might think of me if you have to tell me that my way is not the best way and so we kick against that. That's why I've said so many times and I think it's just a good teaching point is to realize that pride and insecurity both have the same result, right? One is I'm afraid to hear from you and the other is, is I'm too proud to hear from you but either way you're actually holding your ears from actually receiving wisdom, instruction, revelation, insight, wisdom. And he's saying here that sometimes that can go so far that you can actually be deconstructed in terms of your progression in life. John chapter 13, you know, Jesus says I, there's this one small place in there where he tries to teach them about what it means to have humility and what it means to be a servant. And then he says this, if you know these things, blessed are ye if you do them. Because there's sometimes, you ever try to tell somebody something and they go, I know, I know, I know that, right? And they try to make, what are they doing when they make that wincy face at you and they raise their voice? They're trying to stop you from bringing correction into their life because it hurts to be corrected. And so what they do is they make your offering of correction a negative experience for you so that you don't bring it anymore. <laughs> and really, they're just hijacking their own development. So what does Jesus say? Well, I, I know. I got it. I know this. Well, if, if you got it, well, then blessed are you if you do it. And how many times have you ever said to someone, hey, we really need to get this done here. This is really important. And someone's like, I got it. And then you turn around and they don't get it. They didn't have it. And then you've got to come back and say, I thought you had it. You said you had it, but you didn't have it. Why not actually just engage that person and say, do you have a better way of doing this? Do you have anyone that can help me get it done? Is there anyone I can collaborate in order to accomplish that? Like why? Because we want the credit or we're so insecure. We're afraid someone might join the team and do it better. And I'm just saying none of that really leads to being a, a better person in terms of your wholeness, in terms of being well integrated, in terms of being secure enough to be able to receive that type of insight from someone else. If you can get past that, you're really heading towards maturity, not just on practical levels, but also I'm saying on spiritual, emotional levels as well, right? Okay, that's verse one. Verse two, Proverbs chapter 29. 
When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Let me, let me take that verse and I'm going to combine it with verse 4. Verse 4 says this, The king by judgment establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthrow it. Let me read it again. Whoever loves, um, I'm sorry, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. And then verse 4 says, the king by judgment establishes the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthrow it. The one that receiveth gifts, that's another way of saying the one that receives bribes, right? So what happens is, is you end up through certain circumstances to be in a place of prominence, to be in a place of prestige, right? Because it says the king, um, you know, isn't he, uh, if he's righteous in his judgment, he's going to establish the land, right? He's going to set it in place. He's going to create the substructure and it's going to be a land that's filled with righteousness. But when you get into that place, there's also a tendency for people to want to give you gifts. And when they give you gifts, he's saying, be very careful because they're really not giving you the gift. You know what they, you know, they may be, they may be. Please don't take me wrong. This isn't always true. This, this is a general principle. It's not always true. You might be in a place of prominence and someone really wants to give you a gift. But what we're saying is be really careful because a lot of times when you're in a place of prominence, a place of prestige, a place of power and authority, and people give you gifts, it may be because you help them, but it may be because they want you to help them with some other area. And so they're bribing you. They're taking you. I think I talked about this a couple of days ago. They're taking you out to dinner. Um, they took care of some payment for you. Um, they bought something for your family to enjoy. They opened up a vacation home so that you could use it. And then you made a rule. You know what? My life's overwhelmed right now. I'm just not going to officiate weddings for the next four months because I just need a break. And then this person says, I want you to marry my daughter. Well, you already told through like, I want you to officiate the wedding. Well, you already told four people that you're not doing weddings, but now this person opened up their vacation home to you. So what are you going to do now? Are you not going to marry that person, officiate that wedding? Do you see what happens there? So you just be careful with the people with which you're receiving gifts, because sometimes there's things that are attached to that that can actually be really dangerous, right? And also it says when the righteous are, that was like verse four. Verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Because why? There's, we all have a certain degree of justice within us. That's why when you watch a movie, you always want the bad guy to be vanquished and you always want the good guy to have the victory. Because why? Because God made us with a certain DNA. Unless you're suffering from some particular psychopathy and you're a sociopath, then you want the bad guy to win and you actually like watching people afflicted and hurt, right? But most of us, right, if, if we're in our, the right state of mind, we want to see justice prevail and we want to see evil have its consequence. And what he's saying here is, is that when righteousness is in authority, when the leader is the person that's in authority is actually making right decisions, it says the people rejoice, right? There's happiness and there's joy in the land. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn because there's something in us that knows that when leaders are making unjust decisions, it just lowers the morale. And that is true for an entire country. That can be true for your community. It could be true for your family. It could be true in your church. So there's verse two and four kind of integrated together on the concept of authority. I hope that that helps. Uh, boundaries. I see that praying you get relief from migraines. Okay. I'm sorry. I probably wasn't watching the thread there. Let me just move. Uh, let, let's go in between to verse three. Whoso loveth wisdom uh, rejoiceth his father, but he that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. That his there is his father. He spends his father's substance. So right away when I look at that, the first thing that comes to my mind is the prodigal son, right? So you know, um, when there's a son that's wise and he's considering, right, wisdom, understanding, insight, um, conceptual um, uh, instructions from his father uh, on ideas, that, that makes his father happy. His father rejoices because 
I am a father. I have a lot of experience here. I have a lot of exposure to this, and I want to share that with you. And when the son picks those things up and embraces them, then the father rejoices in that. However, it says, what? It says, but he that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. So I don't know how many sons are keeping company with harlots today, but let's just say that that's a metaphor for somebody who's actually wasting their life. Somebody who's so driven by the flesh, who's so driven by their own carnality, who's so stuck in their own spiritual complacency that they're actually, what does it say? They, they end up taking what their father has and squandering it. So does that not make you think about the prodigal son? right? Do you understand the prodigal son? I mean, there's so many nuances to that parable. That's why it's so famous. But the word prodigal, like for years, I heard the story when I was growing up of the prodigal son. I always thought that the word prodigal son, when you read the, the context of it, you would think the prodigal son means the wayward son, right? He's the prodigal son because he went wayward. Actually, the word prodigal in English, it means extravagant. So what happened was the son lived an extravagant life. That's why he was the prodigal son. Look up the word prodigal in the dictionary and you'll see what I mean. It means overwhelming extravagance. So what happened was, and everyone understood this as Jesus told the parable in ancient times, it made a lot of sense. The son has the right to receive the inheritance from his father. That was the right that was given to a son of a father. That's not the issue. The issue was that the son actually wanted his inheritance before the father died. So can you imagine what kind of insult that is to a father when the son basically communicates to the father, I wish you were dead because I want my money because I want my extravagant lifestyle. And if you're not going to die, then just give me my money now. Like, how insulting is that to the father, right? And so when it says here, right, um, this idea that um, when you love wisdom, the father rejoices. But, you know, the one that's keeping the company with harlots, the one that's living this extravagant prodigal life, he spends the father's substance. So the father is brokenhearted. The father has lost his inheritance to the son who's spending it mindlessly, aimlessly, and boat, right? And we know that the result of the, of the prodigal person who's extravagant, he loses everything. And of course, the father's heart is broken. Now, in the story of the prodigal son, there's a wonderful conclusion to that because this says, and the son, while he was eating eating with the pigs while he was eating with the swine he came to his senses and he said surely even my father's servants are eating better than this I will go to him and say I'm no longer worthy to be in your family take me as one of your servants and of course the illustration is God as our father it says that he ran to him and in those days men that were distinguished men of esteem they did not run Running was a sign of somebody that was not wealthy, a commoner, right? So here's the father, the rich ruler, this man of, of prestige, and he's literally picked up his garments and he's running down the street towards his son and he falls at his feet and says, shoes for these feet rings for these hands, put them on my son because he was dead and now he's alive. And of course, then there's rejoicing because there was repentance in the son who was prodigal. But some of us know as parents that when our children go and they just live that extravagant, prodigal, wasted life, and they prostitute themselves to every piece of carnality that's on their horizon, the parents are broken hearted and that child ends up finding that they're living a wasted life. So the proverb is here to, to warn us against that, right? Wow. So let's keep going. I, I know I'm spending a significant amount of time in each verse, but hopefully it's helpful. Verse six, in the transgression of an evil man, there is a snare, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. 
Okay, so that's pretty self-explanatory, right? In other words, uh, the transgression of an evil man, there's a snare, but the righteous do sing and rejoice. So your sin is going is a snare. Your sin is a trap. Your sin keeps you in bondage. That's what he's saying, right? But in a but the person that's living living a right life, they've got a clear conscience, right? They it says they do sing and rejoice. So when you know that you wake up in the morning and you know that your life is right before God, you have a clear conscience between God and man that you're doing the best you can with what you have. You're making decisions based on as much love and wisdom that God has given you. There's rejoicing in your life even when things aren't going well because you know that you did your best. You know that you sought God. You know that you're living your life according to his word, right? You know that you're loving God and you're loving people and you're making your decision based upon those th th those parts of your character. And he's saying here, right, in this particular verse, if an evil man's living, he's in bondage, he's snared, he's trapped. He's like, you know, the box with the stick on it, you know, <laughs> he's going after it. And what happens when he hits the stick, right? He's trapped. That's what happens to the person that's living in sin. But the person that's living in a right life, that's just the idea of righteousness. It just means a right life. It's saying that person is set free and lives a life. It says here, what's it say? They doth sing and rejoice. Is there not a person that's watching right now that doesn't want to have this day, right? It's only 8.30 in the morning. Isn't there, does every person listening to this, do you want to like sing and rejoice today? Do you want to lay your head down at the end of today and be like, I kind of, how, how was your day? I don't know. Just spend it singing and rejoicing, right? Like even though you go through trials and hardships and certain measures of chaos, there's this inner part of you that's able to actually, you're able to have a song in your heart. Like David says, he put a new song in my heart, right? Because I'm so connected to what the Holy Spirit's doing within me. I can sing like Paul and Silas, Acts chapter 16, like Paul and Silas were able to sing in a prison cell in the city of Philippi, because why? Even though they were chained to the wall, they knew that they were living for Christ. They knew that they weren't denying Christ. They knew that they were walking in Christ. They knew that they were led by the Holy Spirit right into prison. And of course, in the conclusion of that piece of history, God just shows up and he ends up bringing salvation to the prison guard, right? So amazing things happen happen when we're living that right life and we're living a life of singing and rejoicing. I'm just saying no matter what you're going through in life today, whether your kids are prodigal or whether your boss is tyrannical, is there a way for you to just be able to sing and rejoice because you know you're right before the Lord, right? Verse 7, the righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. All right, that's just really simple too. It just means that if some, here's the righteous again. The righteous are the people that are living a right life. That's our life that is according to God's word, a life that is led by the Holy Spirit. It says, and when you do and you see the poor, you consider them, you contemplate them, you, you wonder about them. Should I give, I don't want to, I don't want to give a dollar to another man's bottle of wine, but at the same time, I know this person's in need. Maybe I should just leave that in God's hands and give to this poor person, right? Or am I furthering um, this person's addiction because I decided to show kindness? Like those things are really hard. And growing up in Philadelphia, like there are homeless people every day if you live in certain sections of the city, right? And you have to make a decision as to how much of that you engage in. But do you wrestle with it? Or you, do you see, listen, or do you see a poor person and just go, stinks to be you, and you just drive by, right? And so that's your decision. There's no condemnation that's coming from me. I'm just saying, consider it. Don't just be ignorant of it. It says that it says this of the of the wicked, they regardeth not to know it. In other words, they are willfully ignorant of the person in need. Let me take that. That's the application, and then there's the correlation. Well, what's the difference between application and correlation? Good question. Let me just say, because these are some things I can't always say on Sunday morning. Application is the direct way that you're applying that verse to your life. Correlation is when you take that application and then you apply it to several other places as well. 
right? You're co-relating it. That's why it's called correlation. Application probably comes from apo, which means to go towards. So you actually apply this right here, but to correlate it means that you move it to other areas. So if I was to correlate this verse, I would say, uh, I would say this, hey guys, I'm not just talking about people that are poor monetarily. What about the people in your life that are poor relationally? right? They don't have relationships. What about the people in your life that are poor emotionally? Okay. They're depressed. They're filled with anxiety. They have suicidal ideations. And you just say, stinks to be you. I'm going to go on with my own happiness because there's a lot of ways that the righteous ought to consider the poor. And we're not just talking about, you know, throwing a couple quarters in the homeless guy's bucket. That's walking down the median strip on the highway. We're also talking about the people that you're going to meet today that are impoverished on every level, right? Socio-emotional, relational, spiritual. There's a lot of ways that people can be impoverished. And the wicked person just says, that must really stink to be you. And they just go on their life. But yet the person that says is righteous, they're pursuing right living, being right before God and man. They think about that individual and they consider where that person should be in their life. What's my proximity to this poor person? Can I encourage them? Can I buy them some food? Um, if they're struggling monetarily, should I give them some money so that they can make it through the day? But then there's someone who's impoverished socially and you say, you know what? I'm going to spend the day and actually go for a walk with this person because I don't really think anyone's actually said, let's just go for a walk and talk. And as long as I've known them. So I'm just going to step into that and I'm going to sacrifice an hour of my day in order to pour into this person's life, right? Because that's giving to the poor as well. Do you see what I'm saying about application and then correlation? Okay. What do we got? A few more minutes. Uh, verse 8. Scornful men bring a city to a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. Okay, scornful men bring a city to a snare. What, what's a, what's a scornful person? <laughs> That's a scornful person, <laughs> right? Someone that actually like this person does consider the, the circumstance and actually kind of scoffs at it, kind of like dismisses it, addresses it and says it's unimportant and actually attacks it. That's what a scorner does, right? When you're scorned, when someone's scornful, they're talking to you like this, right? Okay. So take that person and they're saying when men, it says men, but I'm, it's men and women. When they have that type of attitude in a community, how do you think that community is going to develop over time? Okay. If you bring that many people into a community, um, that community, it says, is, it's going to bring that city into a snare. They're going to find themselves trapped. They're going to find themselves in bondage to hostility. Um, I think about, like, I can't believe it, but I was just saying this to, like, Sydney, we went out. We were driving in the car yesterday, just the two of us, and that we were talking about just the world. And I was saying, you know what? You're going to tell your grandkids that there was a time when... Columbus, Denver, San Francisco, they actually defunded the police system within their communities. Like there were people that rose up and they said, oh yeah, we're going to show you how powerful we are. And they actually deconstructed the law enforcement systems in their cities. Like, is that crazy? Okay, we lived through that. That actually happened. So, like, there's, this is a great example of scornful men bringing a snare to a city. How long do you think that city is going to last before that city ends up in anarchy? But the rest of verse 8 says, wise men turn away wrath. Okay, so here's the wrath of man. Here's the scornful person. Here's the mocker. Here's the brawler. And it says the wise man looks at the circumstance and actually applies wisdom to the circumstance so that he can take wrath and move it off of the table so that somehow we can possibly have a discussion that would be civil, right? So how does that look for you? Sorry, I'm outside on my back deck. 
how can that for you be applicable today is there someone in your in your circle I don't know if it's your work circle if it's your community maybe it's your kids baseball team or maybe it's your church how do you take people that are scornful or aggressive or abrasive in their behavior and then bring your wisdom into the circle and try to take wrath off the table I mean it doesn't mean that the crisis is over tomorrow right but it does mean that your wisdom entering into the space is actually like what's the word de-escalating the circumstance right how can you be of the ministry of de-escalation because you were able to offer your wisdom into a certain amount of chaos that people in your community are creating whatever that community would be and then again application correlation you can you can apply this to several different types of community and you see I try to do that right I'm talking about not just your marriage but your family and not just your family but the people on your street the people in your city um, right the people that are in you know the, the, your, your country right are you rising up in some sort of way to actually bring wisdom to however far your circle of influence would be all right let's do two more if a wise man contendeth with a foolish man whether he rage or laugh there is no rest okay if a wise man right decides to contend with a foolish man whether the foolish man is raging or whether the foolish man is laughing it says there's no rest in other words this is what Jesus meant when he said cast not your pearls before swine right so the whether whether the the foolish person who in in Jesus metaphor is the swine is the pig you're taking your wisdom and you're putting it out and you're trying to use it to actually rationalize with a pig that's in its mud and just whether it's laughing or it's oinking in anger because you're disturbing it you're not going to by and large right this is a principle by and large if you're dealing with a fool whether he's laughing foolishly or he's raging scornfully there's very little chance if he decides to just embrace his own foolishness or embrace her own foolishness there's very little chance that you're actually going to be able to speak with Wisdom into that person's life right so in our own lives we are surrounded by people some of the people in our life are wise and some of the people in our life are foolish and we have to make a certain amount of determination as to who is wise and who is foolish and in the course of your day you're pouring into people your wisdom your insight your revelation your knowledge of God your love for Christ and at some point you have to say to yourself how much of that do I want to pour into a person who's not going to be receiving it, right? And how much of that do I want to pour into someone that actually wants to grow and develop? Um, I have a hard enough time running after people that want to grow to have them sit down and sit in their space and say, hey, here's what I see happening. I want to encourage you with this. I want to challenge you with this. And then running after someone who doesn't even want instruction, doesn't want to be discipled, doesn't want to develop, right? So we have to ask ourselves how much time we're going to spend with those particular individuals to use our time every day wisely. And then according to the rest of these proverbs too you need to be open as well to someone who wants to speak into your own life so um, I'm out of time I wish we could go a little further a fool uttereth his mind but a wise man keepeth it until afterwards Whew, so much to say there right um, if a ruler hearkens to lies all his servants are wicked what happens when a person of influence actually is listening to wicked counsel then and what hope is there for that community if the person who's the leader is receiving poor counsel then he becomes a poor influencer I mean like there's so much to say about all that so I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter and see if you can pull some wisdom out of here that would help you for today so I know I was talking quickly Hopefully that was helpful. You can go back and watch it again. If it is helpful, you could share it. And again, I often say if it's really helpful, you can meet with us at church on Sunday because this is what we do every week is we go verse by verse through scriptures and we pull out what God wants for our lives. Come meet with us. Coastal Christian Meets at 25. Oh, wow. This is the first time I'm actually saying this like legitimately. 
because <laughs> yeah, last Sunday was our first Sunday, which was like just it's a day I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Coastal Christian meets at 2577 Tilton Road in Egg Harbor Township. And the service time's the same, 930. And we definitely would look forward to seeing you there. So let me pray and say, Lord, I pray that you take the truths that we're pulling out of this particular proverb and that we would apply our hearts and our minds to wisdom and we would find certain ways in which your truth is going to touch down in the lives of others as we apply these scriptures and we go forth transformed in ways that we never even knew. So we put it before you asking to be glorified in the way that we live today in Jesus name. Amen. So God bless you guys. I hope that was a blessing. Thank you. I see Tracy putting in the address. Just um, last week was just, you know, blessed. Um, please continue to invite people into the space that would be helped by those kinds of messages from God's word. As we go verse by verse, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I guess we're going to pick up around verse 6. And there's so much there about affliction and the comfort that comes from God and how we overcome adversity in our lives. I mean, who, to whom would that not apply? So when it comes to the morning meditation and when it comes to Coastal Christian, we definitely look forward to seeing you there.